all about, but I, I do love Sunday nights, and uh, it's a blessing to be here. Take your Bible. Let me go back over some things here this morning that we went over, and uh, if you'd like to, you can go ahead and turn to uh, Philippians chapter 3. It's where we left off, and uh, we're talking about having fellowship with the Lord and the importance of that. And the reason I bring it to your attention is, is because in the last days, the Bible says there's going to be uh, this, this, this attempt of the devil to get you off of the main thing, to get you distracted. Me and the boys were talking about it uh, this afternoon. By the way, if I call you boy, I, I don't, I, don't I, I, I hope you know that's an endearing term. Uh, that's what my daddy called me and I was a grown man. My daddy, I'd walk in the room and he'd, you know, hey boy. I never, I never got, but I don't, I know what's connected with all of that and, and that kind of a deal. And it isn't just a black thing. It's not me thinking that I'm bigger or better than you. That's an in term of endearment. Um, you know, you're not my son. I'm not going, hey, son, you know, kind of a deal. That's, that's, to me, that's even more derogatory. That's like a close friendship. That's what that is. It's, you know, hey, boy, how you doing? You know, that's a, that's a, you matter to me kind of thing. If I do that, that's been bred in me and I don't, I, I don't mean anything by it. I don't have time to think about agendas and you're my friends. Amen. And, and so please don't, don't, don't be looking. You could, there's so many other things I say you could really take offense to. <laughs> but I was going out with the young man getting some stuff done over there and you know, and I said, boy, how you doing like that? And he kind of, I said, hey man, I don't, I don't. <laughs> and he said, preacher, it don't matter to me. I know what you mean. They came to get me today and just go ahead and tell you this and this is real important. I was in a meeting and we were talking about some stuff pretty important and he said, Preacher, I need about five minutes. And so he walked me over to the building. I said, where are we going? He said, we're going over here to the building. I said, okay. I thought something was wrong. And, uh, and the fact that he didn't come get him, I thought, uh, we're in real trouble now because <laughs> I'm going to be making a phone call. And I walk in there and... Uh, of course, a member of our church, Brother Brian, and his son Justin over there have been working real hard to get the air conditioning units and all. And I walked in there and uh, Brother Brian said, uh, you said you wanted to be the first one to turn the ACs on. Well, you've been in church, they've been over there working, trying to get it ready. He said, if you come back by here tomorrow, you can turn on the other four, I'll have them ready for the meeting. But you know what he said? He said, we want you to be the first. Ain't nobody touched it. We ain't even tested it. And so I punched in the numbers and stuff like that. And, and I looked at him because it didn't come right on. I thought, well, I burned it up, man. <laughs> and he said, just a second. And I heard that thing about that quiet. And then poof, that air conditioner comes on. And then he says, run over there and do the other one. He said, you're the first one to turn them on. Now see, you, if you're a construction or something like that, you, you know what that means. That's a big deal. And if you're not, you're thinking, what's the big deal about pushing a button on a thermostat? They've done all the work. And all the blood, sweat, and tears, and the overtime, and the late nights, and away from their family. And if anybody deserved to turn it on, they did. Do you see? That's a That's a... That's an honor thing. That's a, here preacher, you turn it on. That's a gift from them. It's not dollar bills. It's not even equitable to dollar bills. That's just, he said, preacher, sure mean a lot to us. That's all I got to offer to turn on the button. Hmm. I'll never forget that one. All right, this thing now, he said, man, what's happened to you? I guess I'm getting old and getting soft. You know? <laughs> I see that kind of stuff like that, man. That stuff, that stuff tags me. Amen. That's real. That's. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 All right. Here's the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul's coming along, and he's giving you some things. We're talking about maintaining your fellowship, but we're also talking about the cost of fellowship. And I gave you the passages this morning. I didn't finish Romans 6. I'm going to give you that in just a minute. But I said it's cross before crown. And it's important that you recognize that. And in the last days especially, the Lord said, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross. But there's part of it. You'll never follow him until you deny yourself. 
And that's something in Christianity that's missing nowadays. It's the denial of self. But that denial of self is not to the point of stupidity, ladies and gentlemen. There's certain things in the denial of yourself that might mean that you might have to do away with some of the comforts in life to provide the things your family needs. It doesn't mean you deny yourself using your brain for something besides or using your head for something besides a hat rack. It means that part of you, especially as men, you have a responsibility to take care of what God's given you. Did he give you a wife? Yes, sir. Did you take care of her? You got her prepared for if something happens to you? Well, now, preacher, yeah, what is she going to do? Marry Jody? <laughs> you might be thinking that when she's 25, but when she's 75, there ain't a whole lot of fish in the sea. She's been providing for you for all those years. You've done anything for her? You think I'm kidding you? Let me ask you a question. What did he lay up for his wife? Don't you have a permanent retirement package? The fact of the matter is, is that when that time comes in your life, you have to have some forethought about that. And while I'm on it, I know you're standing, but it's good for you. Let some blood get down there to your feet and that kind of a thing. But while I'm on that, do you prepare for her so she's not worried about having enough money to be able to go to the grocery store? You say, what? They're naturally insecure. And they have to be worried about, you know, whether or not they can buy the kids an extra piece of candy or something. That's, your, that's on you, gentlemen. That's not on her being a, a, a spendthrift. That's on you. She knows that everything's okay if she needs to go to the doctor. That's not, you're not spiritual by, well, let's just trust God. You're a fool. Now, I, I know what I'm going to get for what I just said. But, you know, I, I, I honestly, I've got y'all. I don't care what somebody on the Amen. camera says. Amen. i got y'all. But you need to recognize the responsibility that comes with what God gave you. Take care of it. Amen. Amen. All right, Philippians chapter 3. Now, the, the cost of fellowship uh, means that there's going to be sufferings that go along with that. And I'm just going to read this to you, and then we're going to have a word of prayer here, and I'll try to get on and get with it. The Bible says, but what things were gained to me, to me personally, individually, not y'all. Paul's saying, this is my personal relationship. I'm in Philippians 3. Paul's saying, this is how the Lord dealt with me. You can follow the pattern to a point, but you've got to be careful. If the Lord hadn't asked you for those things, giving them up doesn't guarantee success spiritually. Do you understand? You can't follow somebody else's roadmap except to the cross. After that, God forms you, fashions you, and uses you the way He wants to form you, fashion you, and use you. All right, Paul said, What things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for Christ, the excellency of the, uh, excuse me, the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which through the faith of Christ, and the righteousness which is of God by faith. Brother Ernie, you pray, would you please, and help us out. Heavenly Father, we do come again this afternoon, Lord, thanking you for what you've done this morning. Yes. Father, we want to thank you for bringing a preacher back safely to Amen. us. Amen. 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 Father, watching over him as he traveled. Lord, we want to thank you. For your many blessings. I want to thank you for the wall of grace. Yep. Lord, we ask you, Father, that you be with our preacher tonight, Lord. Use him once again. Father, we pray that you anoint him. Yes. Lord, that you give him power. Lord, that you breathe on him and breathe on your word. And Father, may we be drawn closer to thee tonight. Yes. Lord, we want to tell you that we do love you yes. and appreciate you. Thank you for the Spirit of God. Yes. Try to direct us in the right way. Mm -hmm. Lord, we ask this in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. Now, when you talk about the Christian life and you talk about one of uh, suffering or trials or tribulation, it sounds foreign to most individuals. The Apostle Paul says in the next verse there that I may know him and the fellowship 
and have fellowship with him, the power of his resurrection through the fellowship of his sufferings. As a Christian, ladies and gentlemen, you have to recognize everybody suffers. Man is born under trouble as the sparks fly upward. Here's the problem with the theology in modern Christianity, or what we'll call the modern church. It is that you get saved, your problems are over. Well, you've been around long enough to know that's not a true statement. You know enough of the Bible in 2 Corinthians and in Romans and other places where the Bible said, if you suffer, you shall also reign. And the suffering is not always a physical ailment. Sometimes it can be mental. Sometimes it can be emotional. Sometimes it can be things that God allows to happen in your life and other people wouldn't see it as suffering at all. You can't compare your suffering to somebody else. I've seen people live with pain their whole life and they act like it's eating a candy bar. It doesn't bother them at all. I've seen other people who have a headache and it'll put them flat on their back. You can't determine what that suffering is. Some of you wind up having to be, how about this? Uh, maybe the Lord wants you to be single, never have a, mar never have a partner, marriage partner. Yep. Amen. You say, what is that? Well, I don't know. Better than marrying the wrong one and then getting remarried 15 times till you find the right one. Yep. But sometimes it's pretty lonely, isn't it? You say, can loneliness be suffering? Oh, I would imagine it can be. Uh, some of these elderly ladies that are around here, my mom included, have been without their husband, their spouse, and nobody in the house, and uh, nothing to keep them company, and the clock ticking them at nighttime, and two and three o'clock in the morning, and their spouse has been gone for years now. Loneliness can be a part of that. That's a difficult thing. You say, what is it? That's uh, suffering in silence. Nobody even knows about that. What if you're married to somebody that's an ogre and they're just difficult to get along with and they're born in the objective case in the kick it of moon and weaned on a, uh, a, a, a dill pickle and picked at crab apple time. That's a staying my daddy used to say. What if you're married to somebody like that and you're staying married because it's pleasing to the Lord, uh, but it's, uh, it's hard just to stay in the same household, is it? The Lord said it's uh, hard to stay in a house with a, a woman who's like a dripping faucet. But he knows about it but he doesn't give you reason to divorce her. You know what the world says? You're not happy, get rid of them. That's what the world says. Well, I have a right to. I didn't say you didn't have a right to. I said, suppose it's what the Lord would have you to go through. Gentlemen, let me just address this just because I happen to come off of a men's meeting. One of the great statements that an old preacher made years ago was, is that one of the, one of the, without question, one of the attributes of a great man that is spiritual is he takes persecution cheerfully. He learns from his losses. That's profound. I mean, persecution, that's difficulty. By the way, sis, I appreciate Brother Bruce coming up here and working three and four days, 10, 12 hours a day up here, helping out with all the things nobody else wants to do. It doesn't go unnoticed. I really appreciate it. And if y'all want to come up here and sweat, I'm sure he can find something for you and a hard hat to wear. But uh, I, just show up and say, hey, what do you want me to do? And grab a, a room or a break or a shovel or whatever else needs to be done or put those. Brother Ernie, you and Brother Coker had enough of those uh, chair things. We still got four more to put together. <laughs> you, well, I'll dismiss you from the service if you'd like to go to do that. <laughs> See, that makes you grateful that you're in church tonight and you don't have to suffer the tribute. By the way, that was good singing this morning. What was that backup band you had up here? That, was a, <laughs> that had the right ring to it, man. Anyway, you know what part of, the, part of what happens is, is that we, we act like we shouldn't be offended. Well, in life, you're going to get offended. It's how you take that offense that matters to the Lord. The Lord looks at that. Certain things came along and the Lord was made fun of and laughed at and mocked and that kind of a deal. And if people think, well, if I'm living right, I'm supposed to get along with everybody. No, if you're living right, it's just the opposite. It's going to cost you something. And as a result, you don't have to be a snot, but there's going to be contention along the way. And when that contention occurs, you know what you have to do? Maybe that's what the Lord's doing to teach you something. How do you do with suffering? Sure. Paul says in First Timothy, I mean, excuse me, in Philippians chapter number one, that you're doing the same thing that the Lord would have you to do, and that He suffered, and so you should suffer. And He says the same. Peter says it in First Peter chapter number two that if you suffer wrongfully, that the Lord likes that. In First Peter four, He says the same thing over to you in sort of a different way there. And Paul says to you, He said, you should have the same thing in you that you saw in me. In the Christian life, that's part of growth. It's standing out on the corner. Or it's going down to St. Augustine. It's get up from the table after you've had a good meal and putting a track on the table. And people are like, don't tell me you don't feel that. 
I mean, for some of you, it's just as natural as rolling off a log, but you put that out. Don't you tell me you can't feel a change in there, in the atmosphere of all the people. I was getting off the plane, I got all kind of stuff happened yesterday getting back, and I appreciate the prayers and all that stuff, but wound up six hours later than I was supposed to be getting home and, and, and that kind of thing, and we're getting ready to finally get there. It's been a pretty long day, and the fella gets up, and he lets out a couple of expletives and this and that and the other, and, uh, and, and then starts talking, telling some jokes about a football game and something about a Jaguar or something like that. Just a foul mouth, filthy individual there, and I'm trying to get off the plane and go get the stuff and all that. And then all of a sudden, he reaches up there and he grabs this pillow and he hands it to this other elderly gentleman that's there and he goes, man, that's a nice pillow. That's one of the softest pillows. And the guy said, well, that's the best pillow I've ever had. You know what came out of the same mouth of that foul mouth? He said, well, praise the Lord. I thought, that's the same guy that was just using the expletives? That's a strange thing. You know what that is? When he said, praise the Lord, there wasn't no move of people thinking that. Boy, if he hadn't said all that other stuff, if that hand of that pillow and none of that other stuff had preceded it. Right before that, he said, uh, somebody said something about Savannah. He goes, oh yeah, Savannah, man, that's a party town, man. I mean, that's a place where you can go up there and get your game on. Praise the Lord. Is that your testimony? That ain't no cross. You say, what is that? That's fitting in with everybody else. Paul said, I count the things but dung. That means Paul said, I know how to abound and I know how to be abased. Paul said, I got the things, but the things don't have me. You have to be careful about judging somebody by what they do or don't have. And who the ones, the ones that don't have it think they're spiritual and the ones that do have it think they're spiritual. And the bottom line is, is maybe neither one of you at all are spiritual because you're taking pride in what you don't have or what you do have. There's no automatic roadmap. God blesses who He blesses. Have you ever noticed that? And God uses who He uses. Why does He use who He wants to? Well, if the Bible's right, He uses the base things of the world. And I guess there are not many people that think they're base. And so the Lord's like, well, I'm going to use this one over here. Why? I couldn't answer that for you. You don't do anything to get the Lord's attention. He just looks down and said, you. Why, why is that? If you can answer me, take the pulpit. Why does God use any of us? He doesn't need us. I gave him the doctor of the filthy rag up there. Remember the thing that I told you about a long time ago where you've got a rag hanging out the back of your pocket and that rag is used for getting bugs off the windshield and getting the, uh, cleaning the dipstick and all that kind of stuff. Brother Larry knows that little, it's kind of a reddish, it starts off reddish and then it kind of dies out to like a light orange or a pinkish kind of color and you throw all them rags in the bag and, and uh, uh, in the corner of a car, uh, uh, cardboard box and they come by and they get them and they wash those rags and it must be lighter fluid or something because they get all that junk out of them and they bring them back in there like tying off mail and then you pull one out at a time and pull them out and you always had that rag. That was my dad's thing. You kept that rag in your back pocket boy and if you ain't pumping gas and you're not checking tires and you're not uh, uh, checking the oil and the transmission fluid and cleaning out and doing all that, then you knock the dust off the oil cans. Always something. But you know something about that rag? You could tell if a man had been busy doing what God wanted him to do. I mean, what the boss, excuse me, what the boss wanted him to do by whether or not that rag was clean or not. By the end of the day, you know, my daddy said that rag better be dirty, boy. I, it's me working for somebody else. That wasn't me working for him. At the end of the day, that rag ought to be dirty, boy. Well, I told them over there when I was talking to them along these lines, I was just real nice to them, I just talked real sweet to them, and I just said, gentlemen, I said, you know, the thing that you have to recognize is, is that many of us don't want to be a rag. You forget the hand that's holding you. If you remember the hand that's holding you, gentlemen, you know what you'll recognize? Who cares if he's got you wiping bugs? Amen. The other side of that rag is on his hand. Amen. Who cares if you're cleaning the dipstick there on the oil or wiping the grease? Who cares? Look who's holding you. And so you go along those lines and people sometimes forget the fact that God allows us to go through certain things, but you're still on his hand. You're part of his body. He's trying to use you. You know what that is? Well, I don't want to be used. Well, then you're not much of a Christian. Amen. A real Christian, you know what they want to do? Use me. Yeah. You know what that means? That means use me. That means abuse me. Do with me whatever you want. Yeah. I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. Is that right? Yes. Therefore, serve. Amen. Amen. Well, well, what is it in? Uh, whatever he wants you to do. Amen. 
King David, he looks over there one day and he's writing the book of Psalms. He's a, he's a, he's a great preacher poet, I guess you might say, when he's coming down through that thing, besides being a king and a warrior and a, all the other kind of stuff. And David's writing there. And you know what he says? He said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. A doorkeeper? Well, you're the premier king of Israel. He said, yeah, but then to do without him, I'd rather keep the doors to be there. Are you willing to do whatever he wants you to do? May not always be in the spotlight. It might be behind the scenes. Nobody knows nothing. I know some of you, just simply because we talk privately, I know how many times you pray for me. See, that's kind of selfish. No, it's a testimony. Not being selfish. I get a text every Sunday morning at 5 o'clock, or 5, 501 or 2 will be almost the latest from a gentleman. You know what he'll say? I'm praying for you and praying God's hand will be on you today and that God will bless you and thank you and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. I've been getting that for years. Amen. Well, that's just somebody sucking up. You can take it however you want to take it. You know what it does? It charges me up Amen. to know somebody's in my corner and that I'm not going in this thing alone. Amen. You think anything that's happened or transpired here would have happened without prayer? It's God behind the scenes. It's God using a donkey to get something done and using us all together as a unit to accomplish what He wants to do. No individual is accomplishing anything. It's the combined concerted effort that we're walking with the Lord and the Lord likes the unity. But it's cost you something, hasn't it? I mean, some of you have come here and because of your position on, let's say, Halloween... I bet you've got some people in your family mad at you. Oh, I bet you do. I can't believe you go to a church like that. You know, the real pressure were to get turned up on some of you, even if it was by your in-laws or something like that, and you'd ditch the Lord in a heartbeat. Wouldn't you? You say, why? Can't take the suffering. Can't take the trouble. Can't take the trials. And then what happens is, is the generations go by and you raise a group of young men, young boys that come along the way and they don't have any spiritual backbone at all. Why? They've never seen you take it. That's it. That's it. They've never seen you take it. It's, it's just always. And so what's happened? It's degraded things. So the Apostle Paul is saying here so that you recognize it, that in order for me to have fellowship with him, there's going to be some sufferings. Look in Philippians chapter number one. That doesn't mean you go look for it. It'll come to you naturally. Yes. You don't have to go looking for it. Look, if you will, please, in verse uh, 29 there. One of you have that. Bubby, you got that? Philippians 1, 29. Can you read it real loud for me, please? I can't remember it. it something, su suffering few you saw on me. I can't remember it. For unto you is given in on the behalf of Christ. Go ahead. In the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to also suffer for his sake. To suffer for whose sake? His sake. You're looking right at it. That's the Apostle Paul. You know what that means? That means my commitment to the Lord doesn't mean necessarily that it'll be a physical suffering. Amen. It might just be ridicule. Yeah. Amen. Making fun of you. Yes. You don't know some people are getting made fun of tonight because I don't know if there's a ball. I guess it's Sunday. I'm sure there's a ball game on. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. You know what they're making fun of you right now? You know what they're going to ask you as soon as you get ready to hit the job tomorrow and you punch in? Did you see the game yesterday? No. Where were you at? Oh, let me guess. Why don't you, one fellow told me one time, he said, why don't you go to the church where I go? He said, you only have to go every now and then and tell them everything you've ever done. And they tell you a couple of things that you need to do. And he said, the rest of the time is yours. What if the suffering sometimes has to do with not able to do things the rest of the world does? What if the suffering is I can't get drunk just because everybody else does? What about that kind of suffering? Do you not feel ostracized? Sometimes, don't you feel a little odd <laughs> at all? Thank you, Miss Barbara. <laughs> I mean, you can just have a private Bible study. Everybody else is like, you know, well, no, I don't. Sure you do, man. You know, thank you, no, thank you. Can't do that. Change your schedule. Right? Amen. Let me read you this. I got this from the old preacher. I glued it in my Bible. He got it from a, a preacher called um, uh, Tozier. 
Uh, the Bible says this, a real Christian is an odd number anyway. He feels supreme love for one whom he has never seen. Talks familiarly every day to someone he cannot see. Expects to go to heaven on the virtue of someone else. Empties himself in order to be full. Admits he is wrong so he can be declared right. Goes down in order to get up. Is strongest when he's weakest. Richest when he's poorest. Happiest when he feels the worst. He dies so he can live, forsakes in order to have, gives away so he can keep, sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, and knows that which passeth knowledge. Amen. That's the Christian life. Is that your Christian life? I'm just telling you that there's a cost associated with fellowship. And it's time, I think it's important for you to recognize that it's not what good is it for me. It's is it right. You may not see good on this side of eternity for it. It's important for you to grab a hold of that, to get a hold of that concept. Uh, take your Bible, if you will, please. I want you to turn over to the book of uh, Romans, Romans chapter number 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Now the fellowship of his sufferings right there, that, that loss sometimes. Paul says in Philippians 3, Paul says, uh, when he comes along there, he said, it's cost me the loss of all things. All things. Paul was a big dog. I mean, he was trained at the feet of Gamil. He was a lawyer. He was above the law, blameless. He was a big dog in the Pharisaical culture in which he lived. He would have been uh, put at the very top of the pile, the top of the heap and that kind of a thing. And when the Apostle Paul made a decision to do two things, one, to follow Jesus Christ, and two, after following Jesus Christ, to turn his back on his chosen people, the Jews, and to come to people like me and you Gentiles, they wrote Paul off just as if he were some dirty, rotten dog with leprosy on him had the mange and fleas on him. The people that he had been working with and protecting and taking care of and defending the faith and all that kind of stuff, those very same people turned on the Apostle Paul because he came to you. The Lord even said in Matthew 10 when he called the apostles, you know what he said? He said, go not to the way of the Gentile or to the Samaritans, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Paul, come here. They've rejected me, go to the Gentile. Paul got himself in a real mess over there trying to get back to the Jews one time. The Lord said, I told you, leave him alone. But his own people wrote him off. The ridicule that he got for doing what God said meant that those people that mattered to him the most, Paul said, I'd be willing to be cursed for you. That's a bold statement, man. Because why? He loved his people. That's why he was so committed to the cause when the Philippians 3 comes around. I mean, man, he, was, he loved those people. And God said, I appreciate you love them. Now go to the Gentile. Whew. And Paul said, okay. Man, they wind up cutting his head off for it. I mean, they could care less about his credentials or anything else. And the next thing you know, off comes his head. Now, if I'm going to have cross before crown, if I'm going to have to suffer some things, then I'm going to have to make some decisions when it concerns this. And we talked about this today. I talked to a young couple today about a thing, and you're going to have to grab a hold of this. You have to recognize that when you start yielding your members to anything but the Lord, there is a reciprocating uh, thing that goes with that. You don't just do it and it doesn't have any consequences there's going to be a cost associated. And whenever you decide to indulge in certain things, what you may not realize is, is you're feeding a beast. And when you do that, that beast never comes to full grown size. It's always growing. When you grow as a little child and you get out from mama's womb and so on and so forth, and you have mama's milk, and then you're able to get some pablum, and then you're able to move on up, you come to a point where all of a sudden uh, you can't burn all the calories you're eating. That's older age coming along. So now all of a sudden you have to eat less and exercise more to just be able to try to maintain the same level because your metabolism is slowed down, right? I'm not making fun of your girth or your waist. Quit worrying about that. What I'm trying to say to you is, is in life, you get to a point like this and there's diminishing return. You can't eat like you used to eat and do what you used to do and move like you used to move. You can't even get out of the car like you used to. I mean, you think, you know, you get ready. You think, oh boy, I'm jumped right out of the car. And you get ready to jump and something goes snap and you're like... And you wait to feel pain and you're like, Whew, it's just elastic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or you get ready to get out, you know, and you can't get out. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, I hadn't took off the seatbelt, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> 
And of course, you don't want anybody to know that, right? <laughs> but what happens to you is, and when, it, when this one I'm fixing to tell you about is, is you're feeding somebody that never gets grown. So you take that same little baby and it don't cost a lot to take care of them with mama's milk and some formula and then some mashed up stuff in the baby jars. It don't cost much. You let that kid start getting around five or six. And then you get around Judah's age, and next thing you know, it's like, like hollow legs. And it's like, you know, Mama, I'm hungry. You just ate. I oh, know, but I'm hungry. And they eat insatiably, right? And you can't put enough food in front of them, and they don't gain an ounce. Thinking, man, what is it? They're burning it off. But when it comes to what I'm fixing to show you here, this thing that I'm going to show you, it's insatiable. And it continues to grow. And it gets larger and larger and bigger and bigger, more importantly, stronger and stronger. And when it does, if you don't do something to cut off its food supply, it'll take you over. And I don't care what habit that is, and I don't care what bad thing it is, I don't care if it's bitterness or anger or wrath or all the other kind of things that go with that sins of the spirit. If you don't cut off the food supply, it'll drown you. Now, don't raise your hands, but you're beginning to get what I'm saying? Yeah. Suffering. You say, what? I got to cut off the food supply of something that I like to eat. My flesh likes it. And the Lord doesn't. There's a whole lot being said that people make fun of and laugh out. That old preacher's illustration of the black dog and the white dog, and whichever dog you feed the most wins the battle and the, and the thing. That thing is so profound, you can't get any more profound than that. Because it's absolutely 100% true based on what I'm fixing to show you. If you yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness and keep doing that, those things will wind up telling you what to do. You ain't going to tell it what to do. It gets in a habit. Habits are hard to break. Watch this thing in Romans 6 for those of you that are visiting and hadn't seen it before. Notice the Apostle Paul says, you know, uh, come down verse, uh, let's see, 11. Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. That, that I should obey it? Yeah, if it's reigning, do you see that? That means it's the boss. Don't let sin reign in your body, that you should obey it. Well, that's the Lord talking there, Paul talking there under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, if he's given you a warning about that, then there must be something to it. I may be saved, but I can yield my instruments. And guess what? Sin can so reign in my body that it controls me. Amen. That's a little more than just an addiction. Yes, that's a cheap shot to try to explain. You've let something take you over. And when it does, it affects every part that you can think of, including those five senses. Amen. Kids, when your mom and daddy tell you no, I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe they give you reasons for no. But if your mom and daddy tell you no, you know what you should recognize? They love you enough to tell you no. That's right. And what you should do is say, well, thank you. If you got a phone, you know what you ought to do? You ought to say to your mom and dad, here's my number. Can you track me? You shouldn't make them have to track you and try to hide it. Amen. You know what you should do? Track me. Keep Amen. me out of trouble. Why are you worried about that? If, you're, if kids, that's what, you, that's what you ought to do. You say, why? here, track me, man. <laughs> Keep up with me. I, I want to know. You should appreciate that. You don't realize they're setting you up for life. Amen. They're setting you up for when mom and daddy are gone or mom and daddy aren't around. They're helping you. They're developing character in you. Well, you know, did you hear what my mom and daddy... I don't care what your mom and daddy did when they were coming up. You're, they're your parents. You wouldn't even be sucking air if it wasn't for them. So you know what? They are the only ones care enough about you to tell you no. Maybe a good preacher. They tell you no at the risk of making you look like a fool. Can I go here? No, mom and daddy won't let me go there. What do you mean your mom... Well, don't, you don't have to tell them everything. Oh, no. I tell them everything. But it'd be hard. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to keep that sin from taking over and taking charge in your life and reigning over you. Running you. 
The Apostle Paul says this, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, verse 12, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof, neither yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. Can I just say this? You're going to yield one way or the other. The Apostle Paul says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, but I'll add this to the statement, unless you let it. Amen. You're struggling with a besetting sin or something, somewhere along the way, you know what you did? You opened the door and you just fed that little kitten just a little bit. Sure. Just a little bit. You just gave him a little milk. He's so sweet. He's so innocent. He's so, you know, kind of flea ridden and he's, and he's kind of skinny and he's weak and you can see his bones and, and he just, you know, his bones are so soft and, and so impressionable. You just squeeze him too hard and you'll, you'll make him pop. You know, you just, he just, and he just, mew, mew, mew. He looks so pitiful, you know, and you get him that milk and he gets that little milk mustache on him and oh, he's so cute and, and that kind of thing. And the next thing you know, that little bit of milk you gave him in a dish and all of a sudden you're giving him a quart. And then before long, there's some tuna fish and sardines down there. Every line begins as a kitten, as a cub. And you keep feeding it, you know what'll happen. One day you'll turn around, you'll open that cage up and that cat will be looking for some meat. And they'll devour you. Zig, Zigfried and Roy. You know what happened? That guy had been raising lions his whole life. And one day, one of them said, I'm tired of you telling me what to do. And about ripped the guy's face off, didn't he? It's a tame lion. No, you, you dropped your lion. You dropped your, you, you dropped your guard. Gotcha. It ain't going to get you to begin with. Remember the story I told you about the boy with the little boa constrictor? And he played with him and talked with him and spent time with him and then gradually he grew up and teach him to wrap around his leg and then pull undo and then wrap it on his leg and then he'd get bigger and then he'd wrap around both legs and then he'd turn loose and then he got to a point he could get around his waist and then come back down and he began to do that to the point they took him to the carnival and they said, man, this is a good deal. We'll pay you money. And people come putting out tickets for shelling out the dough and asking them to come in there to see that big deal. And he'd bump that snake a certain way and that snake would uncoil and go over and they'd feed him a whole rabbit and get in there. And one day he got up there and he bumped and that snake went. Rrr. And he bumped him again and the snake went. Rrr. And the bones began to crack. And he gave out the escape word and that kind of a thing. And by the time they got him, he crushed the life out of that boy. You say, what? That's what it does over time. Yes. See, the thing about sin is, is not always instantaneous results or instantaneous penalties. It's gradually over time as it gets stronger. And then one day you think, I got it. I got it. I can handle it. I've handled it. Wait a minute now. Hold on a second, man. Get off of me. I got it. Man, you got it. And down you go. You say, why? You let it rain until now it's telling you what to do. I don't know how to demonstrate it any better. John chapter number 8, Jesus talking himself. You don't have to turn there. He says the same thing. He tells you in Galatians 5, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You say, well, what does that mean? It's the cost of fellowship. It's realizing that that cost is going to be associated with suffering. The suffering here in the context of what I'm trying to help you to see is it's more than just physical or mental anguish. It has to do with realizing I have to keep my body in subjection. I'm going to starve that bad guy out. You want real victory over something you're struggling with? You can pray till the cotton picking cows come home until you close the doors and close the windows and stop feeding that beast that beast is eventually going to control you. Amen. You know what it'll do? It'll show up at a real inopportune time. It'll show up when you least expect it. And all of a sudden that thing will be up there. Pow! Gotcha. And man, that's my pet snake. That snake will never bite me. It'll never bite me. I got it. I got it. I got it. And then right at a time where you're thinking I got it, all of a sudden it decides to strike you. And the next thing you know, boy, down comes the cascade of dominoes. And next thing you know, down comes the uh, snow coming off the mountain until it's an avalanche. And then you're buried under it and there's no escaping it. You say, why? You're obeying the sin. It has control over you, ruling you. Suffering means it's like fasting. You know why you fast? It's to tell your body, stop telling me what to do. I'm telling you what to do. You ever have to go to the bathroom real bad? I'm not trying to be rude now. But I mean, everybody's had those times where you drank too much coffee or something like that. 
and, and there's, it's like I'm driving and I'm looking for where's the rest stop going to be or you get ready to go to the bathroom and there's somebody in there and you're thinking, man, it's going to be waterworks around here. Man, this is not a good thing. And you, and you know what you do? You discipline yourself to hold it back, don't you? Sure. You know what you're telling your flesh? I know the bladder and the kidneys may be ready to turn loose, but now's not a good time for me. <laughs> Silly illustration, but that urge to sin is like that urge to, to, to uh, go to the bathroom. Sometimes it feels like you can't control it. It's, it's, it, 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 it's yeah, strong. That's a good word. It's strong. Don't, don't make light of that. It's not just people that drink liquor and, and beer and, and fool around with drugs and stuff. That's everyday life. And whenever you do, you know what you do? You give them just a little morsel. You give them just a little morsel. You give them just a little morsel. And before long... That thing's running you. It's running your thought process. It's running your physical responses. It's running your memory. It's running your mouth. Everything that comes in and goes out comes through that thing. And the next thing you know, you're under its complete total control. I mentioned that to you this morning. You, when you get to that particular point, ladies and gentlemen, you become quite passive. Not passive, aggressive, and all the psychological. What you do is, is you become almost emotionless. Somebody says something funny. You look in the mirror. That's funny. You get a correlation of the two. Somebody says something funny, you look in the mirror. Miss Brenda feels sorry for me. She tells Brother Ernie all the time, that poor preacher, we just got to pray for him more. <laughs> You hear about a child that's lost its life. I don't care if you're just as stinking cold and hard as Ted Bundy. That ought to move you. Yeah. And all you do is go, wasn't my kid. Your response is wrong. You say, why? Something's got a hold of you. Your emotional responses have been spent on everything you can possibly imagine. You know, what is that doing? You're feeding the other guy. Spiritual things don't trip your trigger anymore. Boy, you'll cry over a Hallmark movie. You'll cry over somebody lost a game or won a game. You cry at a wedding saying goodbye to your kid or whatever. You don't cry over somebody going to hell. You hear a sermon on hell, it's like, what's he preaching on that, man? We ain't going. Well, you may not have to be sad about it, but you could at least rejoice over it. Yeah, the preacher preached on hell today. The preacher preached on heaven today. The preacher preached about Jesus today, altogether love you, whatever. You say, what is it? Something's got you. You've been feeding the wrong animal. Amen. And it's an animal. Amen. And before long, you know what you do? All you have to do is listen to yourself. And you realize somebody's got you. Amen. Somebody's reigning in your mortal body. And it ain't him. When the king is in residence, his flag flies from the pole. Whose flag flying from your pole? I wish I could tell you it wasn't true. I'm giving you personal experience. It doesn't even have to be something filthy. It can just be out of balance. Yes. If eating something so much that it takes you over. I'll take your Bible. We have a little bit longer. Look in James chapter number 4. Sometimes these decisions are going to separate the men from the boys as they used to say. Everybody ain't going to like you. You know, one of the hardest things in the world as far as Christianity is concerned is, is unfortunately, you don't have to make the, the choices of who is and who ain't and who's going to be with you and who ain't going to be with you. If you follow Jesus, the Lord will take care of it. Amen. Can I ask you a question? Do you have any bad friends? People that are probably not good to be around? You know, double life kind of stuff? You say, preacher, I just don't have the heart to tell them, you know, leave me alone and they're a bad influence or whatever. I can give you an answer to that. You don't have to have the courage of a lion. You can be the tin man for all that matters. 
You say, how do you do that, preacher? You start walking with Jesus Christ and watch if you don't get shed of them. You work on your fellowship with Jesus Christ and watch and see if they don't drop and kick you to the curb like a bad habit. When they find out they can't use you and manipulate you anymore, they will drop you like a bad habit, man. They don't want anything to do with you. I didn't say you had to be rude to them or mean to them, but at the same time, I wouldn't subject yourself to them. You're under their control. You're worried about a popularity context, contest. Jesus wasn't very popular. Only 500 or so saw him after his resurrection. He didn't change the world back then. He had 12 following. One of them was a devil. He didn't have some giant church. He was not the most popular. The people he came to help killed him. You, you want to get upset? You want to get a Jewish person upset? You show them. We don't have one in here. You show them. You show them a cross. Now, you know what you see in a cross? You, you check me and see if I'm telling you the truth. You know what you see in a cross? You see Calvary. You know what you see? You see Jesus dying for my sins. According to Scripture, buried, raised again the third day. You know what you see cross? You see that old rugged cross and the Lord bearing your sins and I came just as I am. Ah, boy, that thing's endearing to you. It's so endearing to you. You'll wear it around your neck. I'm not one of these people, you know, they can't wear that around your neck. And all. That's a good reminder. I'm not Catholic. But I look at the cross, I don't, I don't see it as an instrument of death or whatever. I see it, man, that's the where the Lord died. Reminds me, you know, at, I, of what I need to do. But you know what a Jewish person sees? They take great offense to the cross. You know why? They think whenever you show them the cross, that you're saying to them, you're responsible for the death of Jesus. You're looking at the same cross. And one of you embraces it, and the other one's offended by it. And they're offended by it because of tradition and because of what they've been taught. And so when they see that cross, they think when you show them the cross, oh, so you think we killed Jesus. You want to reach a Jew? You tell them, no, I'm guilty. I committed deicide. He died for me. He died for you. We're both guilty. And you say you weren't guilty. I said, I'm guilty too. But that's what he you, Do you understand the double thing? It depends on how you look at it. You look at it, we embrace it. They look at it, they're horrified. You say, what? That thing's on them. And they know it by nature, it's on them. So they're not coming to your church service where the cross is. You say, what? They're offended by it. Well, the Bible says they'll have no king but Caesar. Well, guess who's been ruling over them since then? Rome. And still is to this day. Preacher, what do you think about the Middle East? I've told you enough about what I think about the Middle East. We'll have to see how the whole thing shakes out. But ultimately, that little old place over there, that little old strip of land, you know what that's going to wind up being? That's going to wind up being the pinnacle of the temple of everything going on in the entire world. It's going to come around to that little piece of dirt. I said this to a couple of boys at the dinner table there when we were eating this afternoon, talking over some church stuff and all that. And here's the thing you may not know. You, they're probably not going to tell you this. First of all, did you know that Israel's the one that provides water for those people? For nothing. Did you know that the United Nations gave them $2 billion to buy plumbing parts with so they could put in an infrastructure and put in water and sewer for every person living in the Gaza Strip as well as an irrigation system so that they could water their crops? Do you know what they did with that $2 billion? The same thing as taking pipes and making a, making a, remember what a potato gun is? Any of you know what that is? Way really old school. You know what they did? They took all the material, $2 billion, and turned it into bombs they could shoot at Israel. And they're telling you that they're under, in 2005, Israel walked away from that place to the point that they went in there and destroyed any Jewish house that was there so they could not be in that settlement and say, you get back on the other side of the river. We're done over here. And they went back over on the other side. And now they're trying to convince you and you watch five minutes of the news media that they're the aggressors and that they've been trying to make these people or forcing these people into submission. They've left them alone. Yeah. Do you know the land they occupy? It's called Canaan. Yeah. If there was ever a land that had wealth in it and ever a land that had the ability to produce fruits to take care of people, it's that land. Why does it still look like a moon? Because yeah. right. they took everything given to them in order to come against Israel. All you knew about is when the Jews turned that water off when that first thing started. 
Did you, you knew that, right? Yes. Israel's turned off their water. Do you not know? That's like hostage 101. Really, what's the first thing you do? You cut the power to the house. You don't go bring them a pizza. You set up a comm line. I'm in the book now. I maybe know that. And you know what you do? You cut the power, you cut the gas, you get all the people in all the adjoining places that have anything or any danger of collateral damage and stuff like that. You turn off the water, all the utilities. Yeah. <laughs> you say, what did they do? You're going to attack us? No water. Uh, you can live without food for a while. Some of us a little longer than others. <laughs> but you can live without food for a while. You can't live without water for more than about three days. And it's over there in the Middle East. It's hot. You say, what did that do? Oh, that'll bring a hostage negotiation to the table. <laughs> You're going to either move or fish or cut bait. But they don't tell you that in the media. They make it look like that little Jew boy is going over there and causing all kind of trouble. Well, they're lying to you. That's what I, that's what I think is going on. But you know what you have to be careful about? You've got to be careful about using what God gave you for your own intentions and purposes like they did. God provided you with gifts and talents. Are you giving them to Him? Whatever it might be. Five minutes? James chapter number four. Sometimes you have to break from world opinions. It's not just the news media. But you don't need to be driven by the news media. Right. Now I'm going to say something. This has nothing to do with any kind of a political convention or political affiliation. That's what the world says the answers to the problem is. I didn't tell you not to be involved in it. I said when it comes to spiritual matters, you don't draw a line over whether somebody's a Republican, a Democrat, a Tea Party, and what their voting record was. That has nothing to do with anything spiritual. Amen. I heard a, a donkey of a preacher get up and he said, well, I just believe this so strongly. I just believe that when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, that God's going to call your voting record into account. <laughs> Where is that in the Bible? What about people that don't have elections? What about people that never even had an election? I'm going to, you know what that is? That's using a pulpit to manipulate people to vote for his candidate. This is not political. You know what he says? Look in verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity, enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, we're talking about being in fellowship with, is an enemy of who? All right, now I'm not, not going to preach standards to you. I'm just going to give you a couple of things. We're going to go to the barn, come to... 1 John chapter 2, while you're turning there, I'm going to give you a couple things. Now, what the Lord just said Himself right there was, is uh, if you're going to be a friend of the world, then you're at enmity with me, and you're God's enemy. You can still be saved. But if you're going to take on the world and worldly theology, the Lord said, you're my enemy. Don't expect me to come running to the rescue after you got in head over heels, involved in something you had no business getting involved in, and now you're about to die, and then don't expect me coming to the rescue. When I'm talking about being a friend of the world, it's what I call worldly theology, worldly mindset. Well, God just made me this way. No, God did not make you automatically to come out homosexual. Amen. That's not true. You say what the world says it did. See, you're thinking it's something small. It's not always something small. Here's the world. Oh, we just believe that we came out of an amoeba that crawled up out of a pole, and then we grew a little tadpole tail, and, and then we began to get this, and I got an irritant here, and then I got me a flipper, and then I got another one here, and I got me a flipper, and, and the next thing you know, I was out there walking, and after billions of years, uh, I am what I am now. That's the world. Here's the Bible. God created. Amen. End of story. See the difference? Now let me show you the compromise. You have several guys, PhDs that came along and they figured out a way how to marry the world's theology and our theology, uh, Christian theology. How do we put that together? We call it theistic evolution. God initially created the cesspool that the amoeba came out of. And so God did create, but then He let man develop. 
Mike and back, man. You must have thought Adam was a baby when he was born, too, I guess. <laughs> Who changed his diaper? <laughs> Some of you are like, the Bible even tells you the weather report when Adam was made. It wasn't raining. How do you know that? That many years ago, preacher. He created him out of the dust of the ground. He created him for fellowship. What fellowship is God going to have with a baby? Goo, ga, ga, goo, 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 change my diaper, I'm hungry, you know, all that kind of stuff. Lord didn't wait for him to grow up. He just said, Adam, you are. Yes. Breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living soul. You see the two differences? When he says a friendship with the world, he likens it to adultery or adulteress. That means you're stepping out on God. That means when you cross that line over what God said and you start mixing the world in and with it, you're mixed up with something you got no business being with. That's what he's saying. And you know what that means? That means that people that have that theology, I can't get too close to them. Amen. Law of gravity. They'll eventually pull me down. And the next thing you know, before long, I'm adapting their theology. And then before long, they say, well, you know, the Jews just always thought this and Jews always thought that. And I don't know, the world might be a better place if the Jews weren't here. And, and the Lord says, you better watch it. And you say, well, Lord, you know, I mean, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. The Bible's clear on that. It's not the cloudy stuff. It's the thing that he's clear on. Let me give you one more in 1 John 2. We'll go to the barn. I can tell you're all tired. You're ready for a donut. 1 John chapter 2. I highly recommend hot now on the way to the house. If not, if you've got a Panera's on the way home, get you one of them big as your head cinnamon rolls. A fellow got me some the other day, the preacher day or whatever the thing was, and, and brought in a, a, you know, a, a little hand-sized one. It was very nice. They were trying to, you know, we're trying to help you watch your weight preacher, but we appreciate you and got me that. And I said, you know, get you one of them big as your head. See, for me, that's a four-pack. That's big as your head. That's a single serving. That's single serve Paneras. Thank you, Brother Berkey. Everybody else was like, oh, no, we would never do that. <laughs> hey, mm -mm. if it's there, I'm eating it. We had a lady up north. She made some one time and she made a pan. And Drina made me think she made one. And then she said, well, you know, this. And she brought that thing in there. And there was, I don't know, maybe, maybe there was two in there. I don't know how many were in there. But they were, they were big ones. <laughs> and I devoured that first thing before she even got ready to come to bed. And she looked at the plate and she said, what happened to that thing? I said, I ate it. She said, well, you have another one for the morning. I said, it's morning. She said, you're going to regret that. I said, no, I won't. She made them. I'm going to eat them. She said, honey, these things are big. I said, I know. And I'm getting bigger. Bring it on. I don't want to argue no more. She said, well, you know, I, I think I'd take a bite. I said, make it a small one. She didn't make them to you. She made them to me. It's my gift. You can have a little bit. But you know, honey, sugar's not good for you. I highly recommend that on your way to the house, man. Get you that and get you. It's not quite cool enough now for hot chocolate or it can't have me. I can't have coffee this late because if I do, man, I'll be up half the night. But, uh, you know, get you get you. Uh, uh, um, even water goes down with cinnamon rolls. Get you some full fat milk. Don't get that blue milk. Don't, don't get that stuff that looks like you got half water in it. Like it's like buying Tide and the three quarters of the thing's full of water, right? You got to get out of the very bottom before your clothes start getting clean. The rest of it just smells like detergent. It ain't got no detergent in it. You dump that stuff in there, there ain't even no suds comes out. You know I'm telling the truth, but you get down to that last little bit, you dump just like a teaspoon in there. That thing's about to blow your machine up with all the suds. It's like, man, what happened to the thing? <laughs> it's about 90% water. That's blue milk. Get that full fat stuff, man. I mean, if you're going to drink milk, get, 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 the, get the good stuff. Amen. I highly recommend cream. <laughs> man, heavy cream and cinnamon rolls. Whoo! I have no idea what I'm talking about. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. Manna. <laughs> Got to make it spiritual. <laughs> First John chapter 2. Preacher, you shouldn't do that and talk to us about that. No, I'm just... 
<laughs> Preacher of the Lord says, don't love the world. I don't think cinnamon rolls are of the Lord. I think it's a knockoff from what the Lord made man out of. <laughs> All right, now watch this. 1 John 2. This is a command from the Lord. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you believe the King James Bible, right? Amen. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Then say you're not saved. It means you love the world more than you love the Father. It means if you pick up their theology and start defending their position, it means you love them more than you love Him. That's what He's talking about. Didn't say you weren't saved. I'm making a practical application. Look in verse number 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the what? Well, He just made it easy for me. If it's things my flesh and my eyes want and, the, and it involves my pride, God's not in those things. He made it easy. He divided it down to three things. And if I can get those things under control, I'm more likely to be walking with Him. Come down to the last verse there in the passage. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, ladies and gentlemen, of course, that has to do with some tribulation, saints, and things. But here's the deal. If you want your works to abide forever, it's going to come down to choices. Life's full of choices. Is that right? Yes, sir. And at some point in time, as you grow up, especially if you're young and here, uh, sooner or later, you know what's going to have to happen? You're going to have to make your own decisions. You might even still be in the house. You might even still be under your parents' uh, rule and responsibility. That doesn't mean that there's not times that, you know, you're by yourself and you have a chance to make a choice. Well, would God be pleased with the choice you're about to make? You making it in light of the judgment seat of Christ? Adults, it's the same way for us, isn't it? Yeah. How many times you make the wrong choice and there's repercussions for it? And you wish, I wish I had that to do over again. Okay, we'll learn from it and let's don't repeat it. Now those three things, I've got another four or five and I'll give them to you um, uh, next Sunday. We're going to have a hoot nanny next Sunday because it's the Sunday before our meeting. And uh, next Sunday night we'll have the Lord's Supper uh, whether it's in here or whether it happens to be over there, but we're going to have uh, some kind of a visitation thing and church singing and some other stuff over there uh, next Sunday night, Lord willing, and everything lining up the way they're supposed to. Uh, but uh, you be prepared for that. But I'll give you that then, or we'll give it to you after we get finished with the Jubilee. I hope and pray you're in prayer for that. Uh, you're going to be hosting people that are coming from all over the world, literally. You've got people from Australia coming. They watch you folks. They do. They know you all over the world. You say, why? You matter to them. And some of them are coming here. And uh, so I hope you'll be praying about that. Let's stand together. We'll be